Uh, okay, uh, so so welcome everyone to lecture 20. Uh, actually, I wanted to start this lecture by um, uh, answering a question which I did not answer yesterday. Uh, yesterday, there was a question about, uh, you know, uh, if you have these, uh, uh, these Ryuta Kinagi surfaces that uh, uh, intersect the brain, uh, is there a contribution from uh, the brain itself uh, to the area term? Uh, so uh, I, I, I didn't answer that clearly yesterday, so I just wanted to give you the correct reference. Uh, this actually is discussed, uh, this issue is discussed in some detail. Um, in the paper archive, which is called Islands Made Easy. Uh, and in particular, uh, you know, you can see Appendix A for some uh, you know, discussion of an attempt to try and understand this uh, in a more rigorous way. And the answer uh, is the following. It is that if you want to compute the entanglement entropy of some region R, so it's like the entanglement entropy of a region R, uh, then of course you have the usual minimum and extremization procedure and then you look for a Ryu Takenagi surface so you look for some RT surface uh, in this paper they call it V so I'll just use the same notation and of course you have the 4G uh, but then you in addition need to add to it the intersection of the Ryu Takenagi surface with the brain and the area of that intersection uh, so not the area of uh, you know uh, not the area of the entanglement wedge on the brain but the area of the intersection of the Ryu Takenagi surface with the brain. Uh, but this term is divided by a different coefficient, uh, which is G brain. And this G brain arises uh, if you add uh, to the action an additional term, uh, which is called a DGP term to the brain action. Uh, and the DGP term has the form 16 pi G brain and an integral of root minus H into an R tilde of H. Uh, so this is like an Einstein Hilbert term added on the brain itself. This H I'm using the same notation as yesterday is the induced metric. Um, yesterday, we didn't write down uh, this term in the action. So we did not have such a DGP term. And so this second term here, you know, <coughs> was not relevant for the calculation we are doing yesterday and that we'll complete today. Uh, but in principle, uh, you are allowed to add this DGP term to the brain action. And then you need to take into account this term. And so this is the contribution that you might get from the intersection of the RT surface. Uh, with the brain. Uh, so uh, for more details, I'll refer you to this paper and I hope this answers the question that was asked yesterday. Yes, it's great. Thank you. And is that G brain the um, four dimensional uh, Newton's constant that you get by dimensionally reducing the setup or using some kind of random no, no. rule? No, no, it's the, this, this G brain comes, you have to add, so you know, you have to add an additional DGP term. So this is called a DGP term. Uh, which you you can add an additional DGP term that's integrated in the brain action. Uh, so of course you know you might get other con this DGP term might be renormalized. This G brain might get renormalized by uh, matter loops and so on. Uh, but this is uh, an additional term that you are free to add to the action. So this it's it's these DGP brains that are considered uh, in this paper, and that's when you need to add this term. So for us, G brain is like infinity, and so we're just ignoring this term. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, let me just, uh, yesterday we were in the middle of a calculation, uh, which we didn't complete, uh, so I uh, thought uh, I will start by completing that calculation, uh, and then uh, we can go on and talk about uh, gravity in the bath, uh, which is uh, the main new topic that I wanted to discuss today. Uh, so let me just remind you of the calculation uh, that we were doing yesterday, uh, and the calculation that we were doing was uh, the following kind of calculation. You know, we had uh, uh, some boundary. I'm going to make a cartoon because you know drawing Penrose diagrams is a little hard. So I'm going to make a cartoon, and I hope uh, it will be clear. Um, and then there was a horizon, uh, uh, and in the horizon, uh, so this is not time. Everything here is a spatial direction. And then uh, apart from so this, even though we are drawing it on top, this is like we could we can call this a left boundary, and there's some part of region R in the left boundary. There's a left horizon, but the black hole that we were considering was an eternal black hole. So it also had a right horizon. And then on the other side, there was another part of the boundary and which also contributed to the region R. So we were trying to compute the entropy of uh, you know, two, uh, a union of some part of the left boundary and the right boundary. And uh, the surfaces that we were considering yesterday were surfaces that ran at some 
constant value of y, y being this direction, so this is y, our surfaces of, of this kind uh, that we're just kind of running down here. And the fact that the horizons uh, are not touching, the fact that we're not going through the bifurcation point uh, had to do with the fact that we have pushed both of these intervals up in time, although that's not displayed here. The fact that we have some, some region here between the two horizons, the fact that the surface has to travel between the two horizons has to do with the fact that these, uh, you, uh, these regions are, are not sitting both at t equal to zero, uh, but we have pushed time up on both sides. And in fact, it's this increasing length, uh, this length uh, that we have marked here, uh, that increases with time. And it's that length, which is eventually uh, going to make this surface, uh, which is sometimes called the hartman maldus inner surface, uh, lose uh, to the island surface at some point. And there is, of course, a brain that's sitting somewhere here. Uh, but uh, we are not concerned with the brain right now. We were just yesterday considering these kinds of surfaces. Okay, great. So let me now uh, complete the calculation that we had yesterday. And uh, let me remind you of some formulas uh, and I'll just write them down again. Uh, so the first formula uh, we found was that uh, we had a formula for uh, the shape of this uh, hartmann maldacena surface. And this hartmann maldacena surface moves only in Z, which is like a radial direction, except that it's like one over the radial direction. So, uh, you know, Z equal to zero is where the boundary is. And uh, there's a formula for Z dot, which was H of Z by C into C squared plus Z to the two into one minus D times H of Z uh, times uh, a factor, uh, which, uh, you know, was plus one. So into something which was plus one for Z smaller than Z H, which means outside the horizon. Remember, this is like the inverse radius and minus one for z larger than z h okay uh, so we had we had uh, this was a formula for z dot uh, in terms of this formula for z dot we also had a formula for the area of this hartman maldacena surface and the formula we wrote down for the area was um, this formula which we derived yesterday uh, this area as we explained uh, many times uh, is divergent uh, and so you need to regulate it. And this is the answer I'm writing down right now is the regulated area. And ZS is something that we introduced yesterday, which I will uh, write down once more. Okay, so this, there's some formula for the area. I mean, you can put this in a computer. We'll probably have an assignment question where you're asked to put this in a computer. It, it, it looks mildly complicated, but it's not that complicated. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's some, some well-defined integral. Uh, and uh, there's also, there was also an area for uh, the time or the time difference between the two sides. And that was given by by z dot. And then we had to be careful about integrating through the horizon because uh, the, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, the uh, time diverges at the horizon. And this, this was the formula we had there. You will see in these formulas, the appearance of this ZS uh, and uh, this ZS uh, and this C that appears here are not independent. Uh, you see that uh, there's only one, uh, there's a relation that relates those two. And the relation that relates those two, which we wrote down yesterday was this. Okay. So this was the formula that we derived yesterday uh, for uh, the dynamics of the surface. Uh, so, you know, if, uh, of course, the boundary conditions that we are given are not in terms of this C and ZS, uh, the boundary conditions that we are given are in terms of T, what we actually told is that we want a certain value of T, uh, but depending on what value of T we want, we do this integral, uh, this integral depends on one number, which you can call C, and then you fix C using the T integral, you plug that answer into A, and you will get some answer for the area uh, after doing this regulation. Okay, so I hope uh, this part is clear. Uh, if it's not clear, uh, I'm happy to ask uh, answer questions here. Uh, now we're just going to process these formulas a little bit. Okay, uh, so uh, let me uh, select this because we're going to process the formulas. So let's. Okay, uh, so.
So I'll keep the formulas in small. Uh, so hopefully uh, you can read them or refer to them if you want to. They're very small, uh, but I hope they're still uh, understandable. Uh, so uh, let me point out the following. Notice that in both uh, these formulas, uh, in this formula, uh, which you can see in tiny letters, and this formula, you have a one over Z dot. Okay? Uh, and the Z dot, as we discussed yesterday, has the property that it diverges in a few, it, sorry, it goes to zero in a few places. And so one over Z dot diverges. And one place where Z dot goes to zero uh, is uh, the horizon. Uh, but at the horizon, uh, we don't have a problem in the area because, you know, this term also diverges. And so that's not a problem. But there's another term uh, where Z dot goes to zero. And that's this term. Okay? Notice when C squared is equal to minus H of ZS into ZS squared, you see that tells you that this term here is going to go to zero. This thing inside the square root will go to zero when Z goes to ZS. And so this Z dot is going to zero also near the upper limit of the integral. Okay? But it's going to zero usually uh, in a rather mild way in that usually as Z goes to ZS, we have Z dot goes to some constant uh, times square root of Z minus ZS. Okay? And that's clear from the formula on top, right? It's clear from the fact that uh, Z dot has this uh, expression that in general, uh, you know, it vanishes, but it vanishes as a square root. And so you can integrate this near ZS and you don't get a divergent contribution. However, this depends a little bit on what the value of C is. In particular, if you consider this expression that you have here, you will see that this expression has a maximum. Okay? And if it so happens that C is sitting at that maximum value or ZS is sitting at the maximum value, then you see that the approach to zero of Z dot will not be square root of Z minus ZS, but rather it will be linear. Okay. So if C is, is the maximum value of this, uh, and you can compute what this maximum is, right? You can just put in a formula for ZS, uh, for H of Z into Z to the two into one minus D, and you will find a maximum value, uh, which is uh, somewhere uh, depending on Z zero times some factors. Uh, and if C is this, then you see that as Z goes to ZS, Z dot goes like Z minus ZS. Okay. So what this tells us is as we take C towards this value, as we take C towards this value, uh, we actually find that this uh, expression starts growing in an unbounded way because you know when C is exactly this value, it's clear that this expression is infinity uh, because you have one by Z minus ZS, uh, which is not integrable near ZS. And so uh, that tells us that both the area and the time start growing in an unbounded manner when C starts approaching this value. Uh, and in fact, you can check that asymptotically what you find. So of course, there is some complicated uh, behavior uh, for uh, uh, you know, how the area behaves as a function of time. But asymptotically, the area as a function of time starts growing linearly. And that you can see is kind of, you know, is kind of clear from, I can paste the formula again. Uh, you see, it's kind of clear by looking at these formulas because both A and T have the same divergence. And therefore, you know, uh, you see that as you take C to be this value, uh, you can make T large by taking C to be this value. So, you know, you, you, if you want to, if you push the slices up or push the regions up a large amount in T, uh, then that means you have to take C to be close to this value, this maximum value that we discussed, wrote in the last slide. And if you do that, A also grows linearly with time. And so the result is that A grows linearly with time for large time. At smaller times, there's some complicated expression. This intercepted T equal to zero actually depends on the regulator. Uh, but we've put in a certain regulation, so we got a certain intercept, and then at large times it grows. Okay. So this, uh, you see, is leading uh, to a puzzle. And if you had only this surface contributing to the entropy, you would have said, you know, you would have replaced this area with S, and then you would have had a puzzle uh, because uh, you know uh, you're finding an entropy that is growing in an unbounded manner with time. Okay? 
So uh, when uh, people refer to the information paradox in this context, this is the paradox that is being referred to in the sense that you have uh, an entropy that is growing in an unbounded way uh, at large times. And this unbounded growth of the entropy Uh, has to do uh, with, a, you know, has to do with the geometry of the black hole interior. It has to do with the fact that the black hole interior. Uh, this is a puzzle that we'll also discuss uh, in in the in the next lecture again from a different perspective. Uh, it has to do with the fact that the black hole interior. Uh, you know, if you draw these nice slices for the black hole interior, the volume of these nice slices, or in this case, you know, the area of this Ryutakinagi surface, uh, tends to grow at large times. And that uh, is in contradiction because you believe that the black hole is supported by some finite number of degrees of freedom, which is given by the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And so it should not have this unbounded growth. So that is the puzzle. So this is, this is the puzzle uh, or the paradox. And now uh, we are going to see how this puzzle or uh, paradox is going to be resolved uh, by the emergence of another Yudakinagi surface, which will be the island surface. Are there any questions about this calculation and this puzzle that we have found? I see there's a question in the chat actually. Is A the area of the constant Y surface, i.e. the integral of the uh, volume element uh, on that surface? Uh, right, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, it is the area of the constant Y surface. The, the question is, is A the area of the constant Y surface? It is, except that constant Y uh, does not fix the surface entirely because the surface is uh, doing something in Z and T. It's not constant Y and constant T. Uh, so the interesting dynamics of the surface is how is the fact that it moves in some way in time as well. Uh, so, you know, we said we had to extremize the surface. And when we extremize the surface, the surface is not just sitting at constant T. It's moving in time. And it's moving in time because we are forcing it to move in time. You know, if you allow the surface to run from T equal to zero to T equal to zero, it would just like to sit at a constant value in time. But because we pushed both slices up, uh, the surface is being forced to move in time to satisfy the boundary conditions. And A is uh, the actual uh, area of that surface. It is the integral of the volume element on that surface, uh, modulo the fact that it's divergent. And so there's a regulator that we need to put in. I hope that answers the question. Okay, great. Uh, okay, good. So now, uh, how do we resolve uh, this paradox? So the paradox is resolved uh, so by another RT surface which is the island surface also contributes. And that is going to be the resolution of the paradox. Okay. <coughs> Great. So this new RT surface is going to have this form. Uh, it's uh, now the brain is going to be important. So let's look at the, the situation at t equal to zero. So this is my region R, and there is this brain which is sitting at y equal to zero, the brain, and uh, there's a horizon which is here. Uh, but this RT surface is never going to care about the horizon because this RT surface is in fact going to live at constant t. And what this RT surface does is it goes from here to the brain. So this is the island surface. And so it does this on both sides. So, you know, there's one surface we computed, which was this surface. Uh, and now we have to, oh, let me, it's different color. Uh, we, we looked at the thick yellow line, but now we need to look at the, the, the pink lines, the thin pink lines, and those are the island surfaces. Uh, the island surfaces actually don't care about how much you push R in time, okay? So the islands don't care about islands don't care about T. They don't care about T because you see, they're just going from one, from, uh, one uh, region uh, to the brain on the same side. And you know, they, they don't really care if you push the region on the other side up by some amount T or didn't push it by some amount T. Uh, they're just going to go to the brain on their side of the horizon. Uh, and both surfaces are going to do that. So the island surfaces do not have uh, this unbounded growth with T. And that is what is going to uh, 
uh, you know, lead to a phase transition. So you have this yellow surface and the yellow, yellow surface is forced to care about T because the boundary conditions on the yellow surface are such that, you know, it's being forced to move in time. And uh, by doing that, it has to go through this long wormhole in this interior and that causes its length to increase. Uh, but the island surface, you know, is just uh, doing what it is at a constant. And it might be that initially the island surface loses in that the yellow surface is shorter, so the yellow surface is winning. Uh, but you see, eventually, once you go to large enough time, uh, the yellow surface is bound to lose because the island surface is just going to have a constant contribution. Okay? Uh, so let me just quickly explain how you can uh, compute the area also of the island surface. Um, so this is a, a simple computation, and uh, I'll, it involves many of the same techniques that we already uh, discussed. Uh, and so uh, I'll just, I'll go through it a little bit fast. Okay. So uh, the area of the island surface, so now I'm considering the island surface. It's the volume element again, but the island surface only moves, only moves in Y and Z. Okay. So as you can see here, it's just moving in Y and Z. So this is the Y direction. This is the y direction. This is y equal to zero. And the island surface doesn't move in time. Okay? It is still a d minus one dimensional surface. It's not, uh, as I've said, uh, you know, we draw these uh, geodesics, uh, but it's important, uh, you know, not to write, write down the length of a geodesic. And uh, it's not, it's a volume, a form that you're integrating. And that's uh, the explanation for this factor of one by z to the d minus one. But other than that, it's just in, uh, you know, this is what you would have got if you just had a length. And it's something that's moving as a function of y and z. Uh, and uh, the other thing that uh, we need to remember is that one of the rules we had uh, was that this end point of the surface, uh, you also need to extremize with respect to this. Okay, so we need to not only extremize the surface, uh, we not only need to look at an extremal surface, you also need to extremize with respect to the end point. And if I, if I say that this is now, uh, I use bad notation in my notes, uh, I use ZS, I should have used something else. Uh, let, um, okay, uh, so, so to avoid, avoid confusion because otherwise I'll make a mistake, I'm going to use ZS here, uh, but I would like to apologize because ZS earlier was used for something which was uh, inside the horizon. Uh, so I've, we are now redefining ZS and ZS is now going to be the point where uh, for this, for the purposes of the island surface, uh, ZS is the point where uh, the uh, island surface meets the brain. Okay. Uh, for the previous calculation, ZS was the point where uh, the surface turned around or, you know, where, uh, it was a point in the interior. Here it's a point in the exterior. And I apologize for that. And I can try and change things in real time, but I might mess things up. So it's better to just say, uh, just... Uh, so we are, we are redefining that as. Okay. So we are redefining ZS, which now means this point. Okay. Uh, it means this point. Okay. So uh, the boundary condition that you get by extremizing uh, the, uh, with respect to the end point on the brain uh, is that one over Y prime ZS is equal to zero. Uh, this is the statement uh, that the brain meets, uh, the RT surface meets the brain perpendicularly. Okay, at a right angle. So it, it intersects the brain uh, at a right angle. And uh, that is, uh, that you can check, you can derive easily by just writing down this action, making sure that, you know, it's an extremum. If it's an extremum, you can check that this, this condition has to be met. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is the condition that uh, the brain needs to satisfy. And so we need to find a minimal surface that extremizes this action. And that, and we need to, we, uh, we, we have to set ZS by ensuring uh, that the boundary condition on the island is met. Uh, so this boundary condition here is kind of trivial, but we're going to come back to it. And remember that we do have this boundary condition. Okay. It is important that we do have this boundary condition. Uh, and that is actually important for fixing the island. Okay. You, you know, otherwise you could have said, now we'll just take some extremal surface that goes from some point here to some other point here, uh, but it's important that we do have this boundary condition. And when we start talking about parts uh, with gravity, uh, this boundary condition will, the fact that it exists will be important. 
So it's technically a simple condition, but its existence is important. Okay. Uh, so if you do this, uh, so if you just take the action and you extremize it, uh, you will find that y prime. Uh, so once again, this action is independent of y, right? Uh, so there's another charge that you get uh, because the action has a symmetry. Uh, and uh, the answer that you will get is that y prime is z by zs to the d minus one So this is some simple algebra. Uh, it's the same algebra that we did previously, so I won't uh, go through it again. Uh, you know, when uh, you take this, uh, when you take this action and you integrate it, you will find the first integral of the equation of the motion. And this first integral of motion will have an undetermined constant, but the undetermined constant is set by the boundary condition uh, because the boundary condition uh, that we set was remember that y prime had to go to infinity at z equal to zs. And you see that this automatically satisfies that boundary condition. So that's how I set the constant is because in the denominator here, one minus Z by ZS goes to zero when Z goes to ZS and therefore Y prime goes to infinity as Z goes to ZS. And so you see that this satisfies the boundary condition. Great. Okay. Uh, so this satisfies the boundary condition and this is why and now we just need to write down what the area is uh, the expression for the area is of course uh, you know uh, what we had previously except we need to be careful about regulating and we should use the same regulator that we had previously and uh, so we have the same regulator which is this epsilon and then we have an integral from epsilon to zs which is dz just the action that we wrote previously. Okay, uh, the reason we have a factor of two here is because there are two island surfaces. Okay? Uh, in the previous case, we had a factor of two because there were two parts to the surface. Uh, there was one part which was on this side and one part which was in this side. And that's why we had to multiply, you know, we computed the, the length of, or the area of this part and multiplied it by two. That was for this hartman malthusianer surface. But for this surface, uh, the reason we have a factor of two is because there are two of these islands. There's one on this side and there's one on this side. Okay? And therefore, because there are two of these islands, that's why we also have a factor of two uh, that appears here. Okay? Um, very good. And now notice that uh, we can also compute uh, the, the uh, amount that the surface moves in the y direction, which is this amount that you see here. We can also compute how much it moves and that's a finite quantity and that's just given by so let's call that y zero is just given by doing this integral and you can just plug in uh, what dy by dz is i'm just plugging in the answer that we had previously this this answer okay so this is just the answer uh, we had on top uh, which is now uh, being put into the dy integral. So this allows us to determine how much the island moves in y. So this is the same set of formulas that we had now for the hartman maldacena surface. Okay, uh, I don't need to copy them. Uh, so, not, uh, so there's the same set of formulas that we had for the hartman maldacena surface. We have a formula for the derivative. We have a formula for the area. And we have a formula for how much the surface moves in y. The other surface was moving in t, and this surface is moving in y. Uh, now, uh, the, the main uh, question, uh, the main point is, uh, you know, we need to compare the areas of these two surfaces. So the first thing we can try and do is compare what is the area difference at time t equal to zero. Okay? So even that is a meaningful question. And because we have the same regulator on both sides, in fact, the time difference at t equal to zero is something between these two surfaces is something that is independent of the UV cutoff. And so we can just compute the time difference at t equal to zero between these two surfaces. And that is given by H of Z. It's the same expression that we had previously uh, minus the expression that we had uh, for the Hartman-Maldacena surface, which is this, 
And in this case, at t equal to zero, you only need to integrate up to the horizon uh, because at t equal to zero, uh, the area, you know, the surface does not have to move through the interior, it just goes to the horizon and comes out on the other side. So this is the area difference at t equal to zero. Now, say it is the case that uh, the area difference at t equal to zero is positive. So if delta A is greater than zero, that means that at time zero, this surface has smaller area. And therefore we are instructed to pick up the surface, the size of the surface, which has smaller area. And therefore it is this surface that is initially contributing to the entropy. And I emphasize that this comparison is a UV safe comparison because the, that's why I've set the lower limit to be zero. Uh, because the divergence is as you take the, uh, maybe one could write it more carefully, uh, write an epsilon, then take epsilon to zero. But the point is that the divergences as you go to epsilon are the same in both. And because you're taking the difference, the difference is finite. And so if it was the case that delta A was greater than zero, then what would you find for the entropy initially? Initially, you would find both for time positive and for time negative. By the way, the hartmann malleson surface is symmetric. Uh, so it has the same behavior. You would find that the entropy would would grow, would grow, would grow, okay? and so this is the entropy of the of the vertical or hartmann surface. And at some point, uh, this area, if delta E was greater than zero, then at at some point, you know, uh, initially this the surface would be contributing to the entropy, but at some point uh, it would get cut off by the area of the island surface. Now we are instructed uh, when we do the, the entropy computation to pick up the surface, which has minimum area, right? And therefore you see that, let me just copy this here. Okay, so uh, on the top figure, we have the areas of both, but if you want to compute the entropy, then of course in the entropy, in this part, uh, you should not worry about the island, and in this part, you should not worry about the vertical surface, right? So if you compute the entropy, so let's say this is area. And if you compute S of R, the formula for S of R gives you something like this. And this is the page curve. It's the fact that the entropy initially grows in some way and then uh, that growth, uh, which is unbounded due to a property of the geometry of the black hole interior, gets cut off at some point of time. And this is the page time. And at some point, which is the page time, there is a transition uh, from one kind of growth to another kind of growth. And therefore, you get this page curve. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, this uh, is the story of the page curve and the reason it is related, you know, if you think of the entanglement wedge, the reason it is related to islands, uh, is there a question? Uh, yeah, just a quick question. I wanted, yeah. uh, I miss why you brought T that goes to zero on the x-axis. Oh, I should not have written this, excuse me. Uh, uh, I, I also don't know why I wrote T goes to zero. Uh, I should not have written okay. this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for pointing it out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was probably thinking of something else. Great. Uh, okay. Is there any other question? Okay, great. Uh, Sorry, so, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah. A quick one. Uh, we extremize over this uh, Z, ZS, right? But yes. in, in case the, the geometry is not symmetric, should we? I, I would expect that we need to maximize also over the other endpoint, right? Correct, correct. If the geometry is not symmetric, then you would need to do a more complicated computation. Here we took advantage of the fact that it was an eternal black hole and the geometry was symmetric. Uh, it would be hard to come up with a geometry that's not symmetric between left and right because, you know, um, um, uh, well, I mean, you could, you could of course take a geometry where you took the left and you, and you excited it in some way and you, or you, you know, so it would be some eternal black hole and then you would, uh, make some perturbation to it. So yeah, you could do that. And if you did that, you would have to do the full computation of tracing the surface to the other side. Uh, here we were lucky in that we just multiplied by a factor of two. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have another question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, is, is there anything, uh, any, anything in the formula that guarantees that the uh, minimum minimum of the area of vertical surface is always less than the area of island? No, no, no. It could be that you don't have a page curve. You know, if you go go like close enough, it could be that that the island always wins. So it's possible. Uh, it, I mean, you're asking, uh, could it be that the, 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 you don't have this growing part at all? Yeah, it's possible. Okay, uh, yeah. You see, the, the, so, so actually you have to draw a phase diagram. What we have here is time, right? Uh, so I've, mm -hmm. I've put here time, but in fact, what you would need to draw is a phase diagram as a function of T and Y. And you would also have, the, there's another parameter in the problem, which is Y zero, which is the size, uh, which is this. So there are two there are two parameters in the problem. There is this y zero, which is this this point, the distance of this point to the brain, and there is the time. So in fact, there is a phase diagram, and what we have plotted is for some values of y zero, as you increase t, uh, there is. Uh, so you know, let me see. If, uh, so what you really need to plot is a phase diagram. Take y zero, uh, and you take t. And at some point, we know that you know if you fix y zero and you go to like large enough t, then you will get some. Uh, at, at some point, the islands will win at large enough t. Uh, if you go to, you know, uh, if it could be that even at t equal to zero for some values of y zero, uh, you know, there are. Uh, it could be that uh, at at small y zero, uh, maybe the islands are continuing to win here. Uh, so maybe you'll get some phase diagram. Uh, so it it could be that that you know at the at uh, small y zero, uh, it's only you know uh, the fact that this vertical surface wins. Uh, only happens for y0 larger than some amount uh, but the vertical surface you know if y0 is very large it would take a long time for the islands to start winning uh, this is a cartoon i don't i have not actually computed this phase diagram but it's a simple computation in principle but for any value of y0 if you go to large enough time the islands win uh, but it could be that for small y0 the islands don't uh, the islands are winning from the start okay yeah i understand okay. yeah thanks okay great uh, okay, great. Uh, so now, uh, uh, okay, so this is, uh, this is, yeah, I, let, let me just say one more thing. You see, if you go back to the original picture, uh, the reason, uh, and uh, this is, part, uh, if you go back to the original picture that we had, where you had this region R, and you had this region R, and let me now draw this cartoon where I just draw the horizons, which are separated, so this is left horizon, right horizon, and we have a brain here. Uh, then you see in the situation when the islands are winning, if you compute the entanglement wedge of R, the entanglement wedge of R is this entire region, includes this part of the brain, right? Uh, includes this part of the brain. And so this is an island. So this is part of the entanglement wedge. And so if you look at, uh, you know, and this is also part of the black hole interior. Uh, so here's a situation where, you know, this region R is describing the interior of the black hole on the brain. And when you plot this back in the dimensionally reduced picture, it will look like the island surface that we discussed previously. Uh, but in this picture, it's pretty clear what is happening. Uh, the appearance of islands is just the fact that, you know, the entanglement wedge of uh, this region R includes the island and might even include a piece of the brain uh, which it does not otherwise. Okay, so that is that is what uh, I wanted to say to complete yesterday's computation. Uh, I now want to go on and uh, discuss a little bit uh, the question of what happens when gravity is dynamical. Okay. Uh, so if there are any more questions, actually we can take them here because we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, fine. Okay. So, so let me let me uh, say say something. Uh, you know, it, it's important that that the questions we have been asking here and the puzzle that we found in the resolution of the puzzle, it does have to do with the geometry of black holes. Uh, but the question that we were asking was a question, as we emphasized, about the entropy of R uh, with its complement, and this R was defined on the boundary, and so it was in a region which did not have gravity. Okay, so. Uh, Sometimes uh, in, uh, you know, there is uh, some level of, uh, you know, the island formula is a, it's a nice formula, but there's, uh, there is uh, some level of, of, uh, of imprecision in the literature. And the imprecision has to do with the fact that sometimes you might see uh, in papers, uh, also diagrams where one just takes the island formula and applies it uh, 
to a, a, a black hole in asymptotically flat space. Okay. So you might, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is uh, 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 appears in, in several kinds of papers where you might see, you know, some, some interface which we just draw here. And then we say, well, you know, we are going to take uh, this region R, which is outside the interface, and we will compute the entropy of the region R uh, with, uh, you know, uh, as a, you know, uh, using the island rule. Okay? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, this is um, uh, something which, which appears, but in fact, uh, we see that there is a problem in applying the island rule to a setup of this kind. Uh, because in a setup of this kind where gravity is really dynamical, uh, we know that the island rule is not applicable. So, you know, if someone uh, was to uh, write here the formula, which was that S of R was like the minimum of some extremum of A of plus some S bulk. And we'll start looking for islands here. You can, of course, do this computation, right? And there are uh, there are two to the n computations to do, and uh, uh, and so there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, one can do this computation. But uh, the problem is that this formula in this context uh, is not clearly justified. And in fact, uh, not only is it not clearly justified by some calculation in this kind of a setup, uh, there is some tension uh, with the discussion uh, that we had previously. Uh, which uh, would have suggested, so first I should say that this is not justified by when R is has dynamical gravity, but it's a little bit more than that. It's the fact that uh, if we take this formula seriously, uh, there is some tension with the arguments that we made a few lectures earlier, uh, which is uh, which suggested to us that in fact this region R outside the black hole uh, has information about the interior at all times. And if it is really the case that, you know, one should use this kind of uh, formula to compute the entropy of R, uh, then that would suggest that, you know, there's a sense in which the information emerges uh, and which, uh, you know, one would believe if you had local quantum field theories. Uh, but uh, clearly we see that there's some tension uh, with what we were calling uh, holography of information. So now uh, one thing, of course, one could say is that, you know, there are just two different uh, techniques. Uh, and, and of course, holography of information implies that SR is flat. Uh, so it does not have uh, this contribution from islands or, you know, may, maybe one way to say it is that the islands are just always dominant in SFR. Uh, there's an island in SFR, uh, you know, which, just, uh, which knows about the interior at all times. So the entanglement wedge of R always includes the interior. It doesn't include part of the interior. Uh, so the claim would be when gravity is dynamical, if you wanted to state in, in this language, it would be that the entanglement wedge of R always includes the interior. And one thing, of course, one could say is that, you know, we are using very different languages and uh, this holography of information is something that we derive using some techniques. The island formula uh, came from another perspective. And so, you know, one could try and uh, say that one, there's some tension. Uh, and uh, we don't know quite how to resolve it, but in fact, uh, there is a way to bring these two discussions that we had. Uh, one discussion uh, which came from some discussion of uh, asymptotically flat space, and this other discussion which came from computing holographic entanglement entropies, it's possible to bring them closer. And uh, the way we can bring them closer is introduce, is by the following trick, is by introducing gravity in the bath, Okay, within the brain world perspective. So we we'll keep, uh, is there a I'm sorry. question? Yeah, yeah, can, yeah, can I ask yeah. about the yeah, yeah. uh, slide? Go on, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, because um, I think if, if we include gravity, then then the island formula uh, doesn't calculate the uh, entanglement entropy of, of the region R, if we follow the principle of holography. Um, but might it be that, that, um, that if we, include another area term a term for the region R uh, that we that we are calculating uh, something for 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 a microscopic theory so some uh, entanglement 
Yeah, that's an yeah. interesting question, actually. So, so I don't have an answer to the question, but let, let me just say what I think would happen. You see, what could happen is that uh, if you included also an area term for R, uh, you would have to extremize. And it may well happen that the extremum is obtained when the island just uh, takes up everything. So it could be that, that the extremum is obtained when the island just comes and hits the interface. Uh, so, uh, in fact, that is what, uh, you know, if you, if you were to believe this fact that, you know, R has information about the interior, uh, uh, the, the simplest way that would happen is if the island just always wins and it always comes and hits the interface. So, you know, in, in, when we do these computations of the island rule, the island is never allowed to expand all the way up to R, right? Because there's some point where the island is not allowed to expand. We have some region which has uh, gravity and then there is no gravity and R is here. And so the island can at most go up to the boundary, right? The, the island can't like grow to be as large uh, to reach R. Uh, but you see, it could be that if, uh, if you included an area term for R, uh, it might be actually least expensive to just cancel off, you know, to make the island and R merge. Um, that's what I, but uh, that this, uh, what I'm saying right now is just, is not something precise, but I think this might happen if you would include an area term for R, uh, but uh, no one has shown it in, uh, uh, I'm just saying it's a, I, I think it's a, it's a possibility, uh, which one can kind of wave one's hands and try and argue for, but it's not precise enough for me to try and describe it here. Uh, but one could ask indeed, what will happen if you include an area term for R and there should be a good answer to that question. It may not be the answer I outlined, but it may be the answer I outlined as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it, it seems, it seems sensible indeed that, that, um, that it, it might be more expensive to have disconnected, um, uh, region for your uh, for your entanglement wedge than a connected region. Yes. Right, right. And because you know, if you were to, if you were to make uh, the island and R combined, you would actually get rid of some of the area. You know, you would have you would have. So if you had an area term for R, there would be an area term for R, an area term for island. You need to add both of them. If you make the merge, uh, you tend to get rid of the area of uh, one boundary. And so th th that's one natural reason why you know you might have thought that the area would get minimized, but uh, no one has done this analysis carefully. Right, thanks. Okay. Excuse me. So, yeah, the question, yeah. Yeah, could you explain one more time why holography of information would predict that S of R is flat? Uh, yeah, so we, we'll say it again, but you know, it's the fact that if R already has information about the interior, then you don't have additional information that's coming inside. So if R has information at all times and you interpret S of R as uh, being a, a measure of ignorance, uh, then there is no, uh, you know, uh, so. Uh, you have uh, so if you have information i mean we we tried to prove this and maybe uh, i'll i'll remind you a little bit of the proof again uh, if you uh, but the, the main point is that if you interpret the von neumann entropy as a measure of ignorance and if you have all information about the interior then there's no sense in which as you push the cauchy slice up you get more information and so there's no reason why you know the von neumann entropy would change uh, you can formalize this in some you know uh, by try, by basically i mean you you can formalize this on sky plus uh, I don't know how to formalize it for a Cauchy slice, uh, but uh, the intuition uh, is that since you have all information, uh, SFR does not change. Okay, it, that's clear if R extends all the way to, to um, not infinity, but yeah. R is a region which doesn't extend all the way close to the band, to the, to the infinity. In that yes. case, you, you wouldn't have that uh, Correct. flat bar, right? Correct, then you might have a more interesting question about uh, the behavior of SFR. Uh, so if you if you did not make SFR extend to infinity, uh, so you're right. This is true when when R extends to infinity. Uh, you could ask uh, what happens uh, if R does not extend to infinity. Uh, so in the cases that we were considering previously, R was extending to infinity in these situations. Uh, uh, so R was just extending off to infinity here. Uh, but you're right, you could ask what if you didn't take R going to infinity, and then you would have a more interesting question. Uh, it would also be a much more difficult question to answer because you would now have to define in some gauge invariant way the region R. You know, if R extends to infinity, there's a sense in which you can define it because uh, you can dress uh, all observables to infinity. Uh, but now if you want to talk about a region that just lives somewhere in the middle of space, uh, then you have to define that in some gauge invariant way. And that would be a very hard thing to do. Uh, uh, it would be... So maybe the best thing would be to try and ask about regions on uh, Scry Plus. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about that at the end of this lecture, if you have time. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. 
so let's say uh, we include uh, gravity. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, there's a way in which you know one doesn't have to talk about flat space. Uh, we talked about some things right now, but uh, I should say everything we said uh, right now was a little speculative because we are talking about these uh, bulk regions are, uh, but there's something we can do which is a little bit more precise. Uh, so previously we were talking about regions R and asymptotically flat space, uh, not even regions on scry plus, just some regions on a bulk Cauchy slice. Uh, and uh, you know we don't know how to make that discussion precise, but there is something else we can do which uh, can you know which is a slight modification of the setup that we had previously. And uh, that modification is that while we stay within the brain world perspective, uh, we introduce gravity on the bar. Uh, so let me just explain uh, what the idea is. So the idea is that you know we had here a brain uh, and we had a boundary and here we had ADS. Okay. And so this was the ADS. But now let's say I wanted to include gravity in the bath and the bath here is this boundary region. Right? So one thing uh, which one can do to try and include gravity in the bath physically is to try and push the boundary into the bulk. Okay? So what does it mean to push the boundary into the bulk? Uh, the idea is that rather than considering this kind of a geometry, you consider a geometry which is terminated by a, another brain. Okay? You can take the other brain to be at a different angle, be this kind of a brain. Okay? And now here in the bulk, we have ADSD plus one. So this is ADSD plus one, but now the boundary has got terminated by a brain on this side and by a brain on this side. And this kind of a boundary, uh, this kind of a setup, uh, which you can write down, it's, um, it's in ADS CFT, you can take ADS and you can put two brains. Uh, there's nothing that says that you can only put one brain, you can put two brains. And if you put two brains of this kind, uh, you could take this to be a model where this brain maybe has a black hole, which we'll discuss, which evap the, the brain on the left has a black hole and the black hole evaporates or, you know, sends some radiation. Uh, these two brains interact and some information moves from here to here. And you could take this as a model of a setup where gravity is dynamical, both in the brain. So we can call this the system brain and we can call this the bath brain. There is still a point where gravity is not dynamical, which is this point here, and we'll say a little bit more about this point. Uh, but if you just think of both the system and the bath, uh, we have now a setup where gravity is dynamical in the bath. Okay. Uh, so I, I won't go through this in detail because actually there isn't uh, so much to say. In, uh, I don't want to. There isn't so much to say in, in terms of uh, the answer is pretty simple. Uh, so we can make this precise in the following setup. I just drew a cartoon above. We can make this precise. Uh, by thinking of the so-called black string metric, which is this metric, which I'm now going to write down. But this H is the same function uh, that we had uh, previously. Uh, it's, so this is like a black hole metric. Uh, and uh, in this black hole metric, we have these two brains. Uh, and uh, this is this is the direction mu. So this is the angle mu. Okay. And one brain is at some angle mu equal to theta one, and the other brain is at an angle mu equal to theta two. In fact, these parts of the geometry beyond theta one and theta two don't actually exist. And the only part of the bulk that exists is this part that is shaded, which is between the two brains. Okay. So we have brain and a brain. Okay. In this coordinate system, uh, we have a black hole at every value of u. Uh, so if you think of the topology of the horizon, the horizon is like this. And the black hole intersects both brains. Uh, so in this setup, both the system and the bath uh, have a black hole uh, sitting on them. And there is also a black hole in the bulk. And this uh, is a nice kind of geometry, which has a nice property. Remember I said yesterday uh, that one can't just insert brains into whatever geometry one likes. Uh, but in this metric, it is possible to insert brains with just some tension uh, at 
these angles mu equal to theta one and mu equal to theta two uh, and uh, uh, those brains uh, are stable uh, so this is a stable solution which indeed is a solution which has a black hole on both brains and which has gravity in the bath okay, okay. So now we can ask, you know, can we do in some sense an analog of, uh, yeah, I should say that uh, the boundary is all gone. Okay, so there's no boundary. Uh, so there is only a defect. And this has dimension d minus one. So even though I drew parts of the boundary here, this part of the boundary actually, this part of the boundary does not exist. This part of the boundary does not exist. The only part that exists is this defect. Uh, because I have excised everything here and I have excised all parts of the geometry here. So you have a bulk which is ADS D plus one. So it's D plus one dimensional bulk, uh, but uh, the non gravitational part of the, the boundary is just D minus one dimension. Uh, so I hope the geometry of this setup is clear. Uh, and uh, is, are there any questions about the geometry of this setup and the fact that we have these two brains? Yeah, yeah, but, but I have it uh, slightly. Uh, different question. I mean, this is this is uh, drawn in the description three. If if we talk in terms of the yesterday class, yes. So, it's right, but three. what about the uh, uh, what about the description two? Uh, I mean, and description of this. two. You would like to draw a description which had, uh, which precisely is of the kind that. So, if you were to draw a description two, then you have a black hole, and the black hole is connected uh, through some interface. Uh, to a to a bath so uh, you know you, you now have a black hole on both sides uh, so this is the system and this is the bath so the bath is also you know uh, the bath also has a black hole i mean that that's to be able to write down a solution in principle you know you would like a setup where there was a, a black hole only on the system and not in the bath uh, but this solution that i've written down is, a, is in description two would look like this uh, by the way uh, there's a as i pointed out yesterday in this diagram here, time is going here, and this is a spatial direction. Um, so, so uh, in, in the diagram on top, uh, the vertical direction is spatial direction. In the diagram below, we have it, uh, we have time going up, and uh, it's it's how it looks. You see, when you when you go to description two, you should just get rid of the bulb, and you should just straighten out the brain. So, you know, you think you have a black hole on one brain, that's here. And this brain is coupled to another brain. There's a black hole in that brain. So here's a black hole coupled to another black hole. And and, and what and is is this relative? Sorry, sorry. What 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 does this theta says about in the second description? I mean, yeah. So these thetas yeah. are different parameters. They control, for instance, the strength of uh, the effective Newton's constant that you get in both sides. Uh, so these thetas are are relevant for that. Uh, so these thetas are some parameters of the theory. Uh, for the situation where theta is smaller, gravity is weaker. That's why I drew it this way. Uh, you know, roughly the, the the effective Planck scale goes like one over theta. So gravity is weaker in the bath brain and stronger in the system brain. Uh, but these are some parameters of the theory. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Great. Okay. Excuse me. Another question about the construction. Yeah. So if you if you have the the bath. Which was what was dual to the d plus one dimensional ADS, then right. to cut off the d plus one dimensional ADS with the end of the word brain, you don't have the asymptotically um, asymptotic ADS boundary where the bath was living anymore. Is it clear that that space time still exists? Is still dual to to the bath even if you don't have the CFT living on the on the asymptotic boundary? Like you're just yeah. like one detect. Yeah, so there is a CFT living here, but it's a CFT D minus one. So we'll say a little bit more about it. Uh, you're right that we took the CFT D that we had initially, and we we uh, we you know we we got rid of all of its degrees of freedom. So um, uh, you know you could have uh, I'll say a little bit more about this, but let's say you you just think of the boundary perspective. So initially we have a defect, and we have like a a, a boundary. And then what we said was, you know, let's put boundary conditions on both sides. So let's terminate it on both sides. So let's now think of a CFT that lives on a segment with two defects. So this is CFT D. This is D minus one. This is D minus one. Okay. And so now we are thinking of a CFT that doesn't live on a half plane, but that lives that is terminated on both sides with a defect. And then you bring these defects closer and closer together. 
And in the limit, when these defects come and collide, that's when you get this geometry that you have on top. Okay, and I would expect that in that case, you have you don't have a d plus one dimensional bulk, but you have in some sense only the two brains, right? In the dual picture. Uh, no, you do have a d plus one dimensional bulk. So uh, you see, uh, this is the, so th this thing I've written down on top is a classical solution. And this classical solution has only a d minus one dimensional defect. Uh, so the proposal of wedge holography is indeed that if you take the CFT d minus ones of this kind, uh, you do have a d plus one dimensional bulk, but the d plus one dimensional bulk has one direction, which is compact, which is a segment. And so it is a d plus one dimensional bulk, uh, but uh, you know one of these directions is like is compact, uh, and uh, so it is it is the bulk is still d plus one dimensional. There is of course another description where everything is d dimensional, which is the system two that we had. So this is description one, this is two, and this is three. Uh, so. You know, the, the question we're asking is if you write, this is a solution you can write down and what is the dual to it? And the claim is the dual to it is something of this kind, where you have, you know, the, I mean, you could think of deriving this dual by saying, you know, the, the dual of this brain is this defect, the dual of this brain is this defect. And then, you know, you've, you, you've now made the brains come and touch at some point, And that's why uh, the, the, the final dual is just a single defect. But that single defect kind of has, you know, some internal division of degrees of freedom, which we'll have a little bit more to say about. Okay, and so you wouldn't have a problem of mismatch of degrees of freedom between a CFT D minus one and a D plus one dimensional bulk. You would not have a problem of what degrees of freedom? Like of mismatch of not having enough degrees of freedom in a D minus one dimensional CFT to describe a D plus one dimensional bulk. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you see, yeah, it's not a non-compact D plus one dimensional bulk, right? So it's like a D plus one dimensional bulk which has one compact direction. And so if you give the D, D minus one uh, CFT, like the right degrees of freedom uh, to account for all of the Kaluza client descendants, then you, you could hope to be able to do this. So you, you, know, you, you could hope to be able to reduce. Uh, so it's not really, you know, it would be uh, more troubling if you had a D plus one dimensional bulk that was just non-compact, but here we don't have that. And so that's why, you know, you believe that this, is, this has a chance of working. I see, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so, uh, so, uh, 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 now, what is it that we want to do in this setup, right? So let's just consider this setup. So uh, let me just take this and copy it to a clean slide. So in this setup, uh, we want to find minimal surfaces that run uh, again from the system uh, to the brain, which were the kinds of uh, surfaces that we were looking for previously, right? So we want to find surfaces that, that run from the system to the brain. So we want to find surfaces of this kind. Now, what is the rule that we, we want to introduce? Uh, we want to say, uh, let's, just, let's first just look for minimal surfaces, okay? And let's, let's ask what, uh, what, what we will find. And the rule that we want, to, uh, we want to find minimal surfaces, so we look for, for minimal surfaces or extremal surfaces. that run from system to bath. Okay. But uh, we demand uh, that uh, just as uh, we demanded previously that this surface should be an extremum at P1, uh, we extremize with respect to both P1 and P2. So another way of saying it is we demand that this surface is an extremal surface, not just with respect to deformations in the bulk, but also with respect to deformations of the endpoints. Now, what is the justification uh, for this rule? Uh, so the justification for this rule is that, you know, uh, we were using this, uh, this, you know, we were using this prescription earlier for minimal surfaces uh, that ended on uh, the brain. And when we had these minimal surfaces that ended on the brain, we were saying, well, look, you know, the minimal surface, the endpoint of the minimal surface is in dynamical gravity. And therefore, if I want to compute an entanglement entropy, I should extremize with respect to the endpoint of that minimal surface. And now both points are in the region of dynamical gravity. And therefore, I should extremize with respect to both points. Okay? Now, if you ask for such a minimal surface, uh, what is the result that you find? The result is that the only surface 
only such surface is the horizon. So if you insist that you're looking for an extremal surface, which has the property that, you know, it, uh, uh, it uh, is also an extremum with respect to both the endpoints, uh, then there is only one such surface and that is the horizon. I can't see this in my own screen, so maybe I should push this up. Okay. So the only such surface uh, is the horizon. Now, what is this telling us? Okay, what is the fact that the only such surface is the horizon telling us? So it's telling us uh, two things. Uh, it's telling us, uh, you know, in some, this is not computing. Of course, there's an entropy associated with this, and the entropy is just the area of the horizon. Uh, but you know, it, what it's actually telling us, and the way we should interpret this, is that. When gravity is dynamical, we are unable to define a non-trivial radiation region. You know, it could have happened, although you know, you could have imagined a scenario where you could have had a family of surfaces, right? Or you could have thought. You know, maybe uh, there's some flat direction in P2, and therefore, wherever the surface ends on P2, uh, that uh, is automatically an extremum. And in principle, it could have happened that P2 could have been a flat direction, or, you know, it could have happened that you had multiple endpoints. Uh, and so it could have happened that there was some choice of radiation regions. You know, maybe you're allowed like 10 different choices of radiation regions, or maybe you're allowed a continuum of radiation regions. Uh, but in fact, it's a simple geometric analysis to show that such radiation regions don't exist. And the conclusion is therefore that when gravity is dynamical, uh, we are just unable to define uh, this radiation region. It just shrinks uh, to a point. And the entanglement wedge of the defect is always the entire exterior. Okay. And of course, as a result, because you know there is no phase transition to speak of, there's only one surface anyway, so there's no page curve. In fact, you should have expected all of these results uh, from the discussions we had earlier about the holography of information. And you know, you in particular, you should have expected the fact that when gravity is dynamical. Uh, you should not be able to define a radiation region. And let me just briefly explain why you should have expected all of these results. You see, you might have thought, let's just think about the second brain. Okay, so this is the Bath brain. The point is that if you take some region here and you want to call it R, and you want to call this region R tilde, and this is where the defect is. Then you would find that because gravity, so here I'm forgetting about the bulk, I'm just thinking about the brain. You would find that because gravity is dynamical, if you want to define an operator in R, you have to dress it to the defect. You have to dress it to some part where gravity is not dynamical. So you have to dress an operator using a Wilson line, and this is an operator in R. And so there is no sense in which you can define a set of operators on algebra of R that is entirely localized to R. And that is a discussion that we have had many times before, uh, where we have said that, you know, when gravity is dynamical, uh, you have to dress operators to infinity. Here, infinity is a defect. Uh, and, you know, because R is surrounded by R tilde, if you think about this geometry, if you try to say that, you know, this was R, then this would be R tilde. And there's no way to reach infinity without running uh, through R tilde. So th this is a cross section of the same figure. And you see that, you know, to define an operator in R, you need a Wilson line that goes to the defect. And therefore, uh, you know, we do not expect, expect to be able to define an algebra corresponding only to R. And that's point one. Uh, the result we have is a geometric result. Uh, you know, it's a result about minimal surfaces, uh, but you can understand the geometric result from the fact that, you know, you don't expect to see an algebra corresponding to R. What about the second fact? The fact that the entanglement entropy of the defect is the entire exterior. Well, that's something that we have also seen. Uh, you know, if you take this figure, uh, then uh, you would have expected, well, actually, if you uh, if you were to just run the, uh, 
uh, let, let me explain it in this video. If you just, just run the arguments that we had, you know, that we used to argue for holography of information uh, in, uh, in ADS, you would have concluded that if you took this kind of a space time, this wedge space time, then all the information in the space time would be available in the part where gravity is non dynamical, which is the defect. And therefore, you should expect that the defect has information about all of this region. The reason it has information only about the exterior is because you have entangled the defect with another setup, with another defect. And if you were to take the union of both defects, uh, they have information about all the space time. So in this setup, you would once again have argued, you know, the, the argument that you needed to run that was where is the Hamiltonian defined, right? And in this, if you just do an analysis of canonical gravity, the Hamiltonian is defined here. This is the part where gravity, this is where asymptotic infinity is. And so the Hamiltonian is defined here. And therefore, this region has information about all the bulk. And so, even though you found point B through a geometric analysis, you should have expected it also from holography of information. So point you know, A prime, which is the understanding of A, I just explained, and B prime, which is the understanding of B, is that the Hamiltonian is defined near the defect. And therefore, the defect has information about all, all of the space. I mean, the, gravito the gravitational Hamilton is defined near the defect. And the fact that there's no page curve we discussed, and of course, there's no page curve because the defect always has information about what's happening in the interior. And so that's the reason there is no page curve uh, in the setup where gravity is, uh, is dynamical in the bar. Okay. Uh, now, this uh, is something that, uh, uh, you know, is. Is that a question? Yeah. 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 Yes. So yeah, I have yeah. a question about point B. So yeah. I think I don't. I don't understand the point you made about why entanglement bridge of the defect does not have exterior. Sorry, interior. Oh, uh, in the context of holography of information. Yeah. Uh, you see, even in the case of holography. So in in this case, there are actually two Hamiltonians. So in the context of you know, uh, if, when you have two asymptotic regions, it is not actually the case that the Hamil. So really the Hamiltonian is defined near the union of the two defects. There's one term which comes from one side and there's another term which comes from the other side. Uh, can you see the bottom of the screen or is it not visible? Yeah, 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 I can see. Yeah, so you know, it, it's the fact that the Hamiltonian, there are actually two terms in the Hamiltonian which are coming from both boundaries, one the top boundary or the left boundary and one the other boundary. And so that's why, uh, you know, if you, you should include both terms. And so, uh, you know, if you only include one term, uh, if you, you know, then, then you would have information about one side uh, if you include both terms, you would have information about the entire geometry. Okay, so it's it's actually because of the uh, two, uh, the because Hamiltonian being the depend on two. Yeah, it's because the, the so maybe I should draw a clearer figure. You see, uh, we have this defect here, and there's a horizon, but there's uh, you have to there's another uh, defect on the other side. So. Uh, there's, I don't know what we should call this. Let's call this the top defect. And this is the bottom defect. If you take this entire geometry, then the Hamiltonian actually is a sum of two terms, one which is defined here and one which is defined here because they're two asymptotic regions. So it's really, you know, if you say the asymptotic regions have information about the interior, it's the union of this and this that have information about the interior. Okay. Okay. And, but if you only take this, uh, then you can argue that that has information about this part. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay. So, so then uh, the last part is, is what we're discussing about, you know, why given that you have always have information outside, uh, you don't expect uh, to see a page curve. And this story that we are describing is not something, in fact, is something that is, that is understood even independently. Uh, it's understood through a proposal called wedge holography. And wedge holography is in fact, the proposal that we discussed uh, in, in the answer to one of the questions. It is the fact that if you take ADS D plus one uh, on a wedge, that this is dual uh, to a CFT D minus one. Um, and so uh, indeed uh, there is a proposal that says that there's a generalization of holography, uh, which is when you take uh, uh, ADS D plus one on a wedge, which is terminated by, by brains or boundaries, then uh, the dual to this is just a CFTD minus one. And in fact, I already explained how that happens. Uh, one way uh, to understand this uh, is that, uh, you know, you can ask about, uh, 
uh, you can first start with CFTs, a CFTD that lives in a segment. So this is a CFTD. So the CFTD that lives in a segment. And if you believe what we said before, you still have two brains, even though the solution is much harder to find. And then we take the limit. And in the limit, the CFTD ceases to exist and we just have a CFTD minus one on a defect. Okay. So now, uh, this being said, uh, in fact, this uh, leads to another uh, thing that we can do. You see, even in this setup where gravity is dynamical, uh, as uh, we have said now a few times, there is one part of the space time uh, which uh, does have, which does not have dynamical gravity, and that is this defect. And if you think about how this we obtained the CFTD minus one on a defect, you will see that in fact this CF, you know, in the original setup where you had the CFTD that was living on a segment, you had two copies of a CFTD minus one. Let me call this the left CFTD minus one, and let me call this the right CFTD minus one. Uh, we are running short of words here because there is also the CFTs on the two asymptotic boundaries. I want to clarify that these CFTs, this left and right, is not referring to the asymptotic boundaries. It's just the fact that you know, uh, on each asymptotic boundary. Uh, we can obtain the CFTD minus one that lives on a defect by taking this limit. And in when we take this limit, we have some degrees of freedom that live on the two defects. When we take the limit, the degrees of freedom merge, but we can still ask, what is the entropy of the left with the right? Okay. One can ask, what is S of left top CFTD minus one? union left bottom CFTD minus one. Okay. So uh, this is a little confusing. So I'll explain uh, in a little bit more detail. You see, uh, we have these two asymptotic regions and let's forget about the bulk entirely, right? So we have these two asymptotic regions and let's imagine that we've not taken quite the limit where the, the boundary has shrunk to zero, uh, but we still have these two defects which have CFTD minus ones. And we have the whole system. So let's call this top. Let's call this L. Let's call this L. And let's call this R. Okay. So the whole system is in a thermophile double state. The top is in a thermophile double state entangled with the bottom. And the question we are asking is, what is the entropy of the union of the top left and the top bottom? That is what I just circled. So is the entropy, it's some internal division of the CFTD minus one degrees of freedom. And we're asking what is the entropy or the entanglement of these parts of the CFT with the right, which is these parts of the CFT. Okay. And that is a question we can ask. Uh, so you can call it the left right entanglement entropy if you like. And there is a natural holographic prescription to compute the left right entanglement entropy. And the natural holographic prescription to compute the left-right entanglement entropy, in fact, is almost the same as the prescription that we were using before. It is to look for surfaces that run through the middle. So this is now top, bottom. Here's a horizon. And here's a horizon. And now we look for surfaces that run from the top to the bottom. And these surfaces, you know, if you were to separate the top part, if you were to divide the top part into a left and a right by slightly separating the left and right degrees of freedom, then these surfaces would be precisely homologous to the union of the left top and the left bottom. Uh, and they would separate the left top and the left bottom from the right top and the right bottom. Okay. So this is a holographic prescription prescription to compute this S L R okay, which is what I define. Now, if you're computing this kind of a quantity, then for this kind of a quantity, you can once again, ask the question that we asked previously, uh, which is what if you start evolving now both systems with time, 
And you ask, you know, we say that the left, the top system was entangled with the bottom system in a thermophile double state, but we have now internally divided the top system into two parts and the bottom system into two parts. And we can ask, how does the entanglement of this internal division vary as a function of time? And you see that in the bulk, this entanglement will once again grow with a function of time, precisely because of the diagram that you see in front of you, where the horizon in the bulk will develop a wormhole that starts extending as a function of time. And once again, this growth will be cut off by the appearance of an island surface, which runs from the top, from the defect to the brain. Okay. So this is now an island surface that runs from the defect to the brain. So there are many interesting uh, aspects uh, to this computation. Uh, there's a phase diagram that you can compute. And once again, uh, you will find a page curve. Uh, you will find a page curve for SLR. So this does obey a page curve. It follows a page curve provided some geometric restrictions are met, which I don't want to go into right now, uh, but it follows a page curve provided these brains uh, meet certain geometric restrictions. And uh, then this page curve has precisely the form uh, that we saw previously, which is that, you know, there is one contribution to this entropy which grows with time. And then there's another contribution which cuts it off after some time. So we see the, the moral of the story is that there is no pH curve if you try and ask for, you know, you try and define a radiation region, but it may still happen that there is a pH curve for other interesting questions. Okay? So the model that at least, I, I mean, it's just a model. So there's no, there's, no, uh, uh, there's no, no proof of this. And perhaps you could take a different model from this discussion. Uh, but the, the model that, that I think that uh, is relevant here is that when gravity is dynamical, uh, there's no page curve for the fine grain entropy of the radiation. But there might still be but the page curve might still add answer other interesting questions. And that is what we see here. We see here that there is one question which you could ask, which you could, you know, you could try and define the entropy, or you could try and define some radiation region. Uh, so you could try and ask, you know, in what sense uh, is, uh, you know, is there some sense in which I can ask uh, uh, about defining a radiation region by computing minimal surfaces. And there's some geometric thing that tells you you can't really define a well-defined radiation region. And, uh, you know, there's some understanding we have of that from the other arguments that we gave, which is that, you know, uh, you shouldn't be able to define in some gauge invariant way a radiation region. But there are some other questions you can ask. And these other questions are often, in some sense, non-gravitational questions. And the question we asked here as well was a question of, you know, the entanglement entropy of one part of the defect with another part of the defect. And so that's a question where you could factorize the Hilbert space. So the reason I say non-gravitational is that to see a page curve, you need to see a factorization of the Hilbert space. And even when gravity is dynamical, there's nothing that says that, you know, there's no way you can factorize the Hilbert space. You can factorize the Hilbert space in some ways. And for when you are able to factorize the Hilbert space, you might still see a page curve as we see here. So the last thing I wanted to discuss uh, in just a few minutes, uh, and since we are running out of time, is, um, is the following question. And I, I wanted to do this so we can go on to another topic next time. Okay. So the question I wanted to ask is, can we see a page curve in flat space? Can I, I'll just give you five minutes of discussion on that. In any case, we don't have something extremely precise to say, but I'm going to try and uh, say, say a few words about can we see a page curve in flat space, okay? And uh, the reason I say this comes from the model that we had previously, uh, which is by that you can ask a different question, not about SFR, but a different question. So I'm going to say a little bit about what is the kind of question that you could ask for which you might see a page curve even for black hole evaporation in flat space. Okay. 
So uh, let me remind you that when we discussed uh, the evaporation of these black holes, we said that I might go a couple of minutes over time. Uh, yeah. So we said that you know if you were to compute the entropy of this region, then this region, the entropy of this region is independent of u zero. Okay. So s, and that is because we said that all the information was already available on the past boundary of future null infinity, which is the discussion uh, that we had. Uh, some time back as well. Okay. So if you were to really compute the fine grain entropy of this region, uh, you would expect you know, to see something where the page curve is flat and you don't see something that varies. But you can ask a different question. The different question is, can we somehow discard gravitational effects? Okay, so that's the question that we can ask. And can we somehow discard gravitational effects in order to be able to see a page curve? And let me now try and explain what a natural guess for how to discard gravitational effects might be. Okay. Uh, I have to remind uh, you of some things that uh, you might have forgotten when we did this flat space. Uh, but uh, let, uh, let me just remind you of that the operator algebra was generated by components of the metric and had what was called the Bondi news. This was called the Bondi news. And it also had what was called the Bondi mass. This was called the mass aspect. Now the distinction between these were both components of the metric. The distinction between these, these components was that in the gauge that we chose, this corresponded to dynamical gravity modes. Okay, so this was what we would call the graviton or the propagating spin two degrees of freedom. And this corresponded to the constrained degrees of freedom. You know, if you read uh, uh, Mr. Thorn and Wheeler, uh, they call this uh, the children of light and the children of darkness. Okay. So these are the, uh, what the Bondi mass uh, is like the children of darkness because it's the constraints and uh, the, 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 the Bondi news is uh, are the children of light because uh, those are the things which are dynamic. Okay? So there are constraints in gravity and uh, you divide the metric into two parts, one of which has the news and the other which has the constraints. And in some sense, you know, this is an artificial division. It has to do with how you chose to divide the degrees of freedom. Uh, but this is how this division is done conventionally. And now you find that the following things for the commutators, uh, and let me just remind you, and since we're running out of time, I'll do it fast. You find that if you look at the NN commutator, let me be schematic, uh, in the notes that I'll upload to the website, uh, this is written more precisely, uh, but you find that this is delta prime of U minus U prime. So this is like a local commutator. On the other hand, you find that if you compute like the integral of M and you compute this at some point U, when I say integral, I mean you integrate over Omega and you compute the commutator with Omega prime. This is the commutator that has a non-locality because it has something which has a theta of U prime minus U. So this is uh, what we've been finding, that the constraints are the things that prevent the factorization of the Hilbert space. Now, in general, one can't just throw away the constraints because when things are interacting, you know, uh, you try and take two degrees of freedom that you thought were dynamical and you put them, you know, you start multiplying them and you start generating the constraints. But at infinity, it is possible, it is mathematically possible, but scry plus, it is mathematically consistent to think of the algebra of n. of only the news. If you do that, uh, you see that this is, it's physically a little artificial. It's physically artificial because 
you know, if you were to measure something like the Riemann tensor, or you were to make some, some measurement, uh, you would need all components of the metric. You know, it's not like you can get away with one component and get and not uh, keep track of other components. But mathematically, because at null infinity, the Hilbert space, the operator algebra becomes the operator algebra for Fox space, it's consistent to throw out the, the Bondi mass and it does not reappear uh, when you start multiplying the news with itself. And so it's mathematically consistent to think of only this algebra. And so we might expect, or we might hope, that the entropy with respect to this algebra to this restricted algebra obeys a page curve. Okay, let me just say one last thing. Uh, no one has shown this. This is a hope, uh, but you know it is consistent with the model that we had previously. That even when gravity is everywhere dynamical, you might see a page curve. But let me just say one last thing, uh, and then I'll stop. Uh, I remind uh, I remind you that when we discussed uh, flat space, uh, the the Hilbert space has both hard and soft degrees of freedom. So a general state in the Hilbert space was of this form. It had some soft vacuum, had some soft de degrees of freedom, and it had some hard degrees of freedom. Okay. Now this algebra that is written in point one is blind to the soft degrees of freedom. It does not see the soft degrees of freedom at all. Uh, because, you know, that information lives in the Bondi mass, it lives in something called the shear, but it does not live in the Bondi news, the, the news operators, uh, you know, cannot distinguish between a state with one set of soft charges and another set of soft charges. And therefore, the only way, you know, even if you restrict it to get this factorized algebra, the only way that this algebra would follow a page curve is if the hard soft entanglement is not large. If the hard soft entanglement is large, then you would always see only a mixed state by thinking of only the news operators. And the only way you might be able to see a page curve uh, is if the hard soft entanglement is not large. Uh, so uh, what I said right now is just uh, a picture of hope for how things might go. Uh, there's nothing precise. Uh, but I think it's clear that there are some possibilities, uh, some questions you could ask even when gravity is dynamical, which would yield a page curve. One natural guess for such a question in asymptotically flat space would be to look at the algebra of the news operators, and you might expect to see a page curve for that, provided that the hard soft entanglement is not large. Uh, this is something that, you know, there's been some debate on. Uh, there was this work by Hawking Perry Strominger that suggested that the hard soft entanglement is large. Uh, and then there have been other papers questioning whether that is the case. Uh, so this is an open question, I think. Uh, there are various people have various biases about this question. Uh, and uh, this is therefore also an open question. Uh, but I think it's an interesting direction which one can think about. Uh, okay, so I'm sorry for going over time. Uh, I will stop here uh, and we can take questions if there are questions. I have one. I sure. Will say. So yeah. Uh, as you said, this this is physically artificial, right? It, it sounds physically artificial as well. So yeah. wh why is it so interesting? I would say why are we so interested in finding a page curve in this case? Okay, I, I'm sympathetic to that idea. I agree with you uh, that we don't. Um, 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 I agree. Uh, it's yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I agree. You know, to make it physically interesting, you would also have to find some way to not make it physical. You'd have to somehow say that it's somehow natural to measure the news or somehow it's easier to measure the news. Or, you know, you'd have to say that if I set up like a natural measuring apparatus, you would somehow see the news and not see the, the constraints. Uh, so um, uh, it, you would have to come up with some argument of that kind, which would, which would, uh, which would help you make, uh, get rid of point two. Uh, but even other than that, I mean, I agree with you that we don't have to see the page curve, uh, but it's a, um, you know, 
uh, yeah. I, okay, I agree with you that it's it's not it's not it's not necessarily the most interesting question of uh, how can you force the page curve to appear. Uh, but uh, if you did want to see a page curve, uh, uh, then you know this may be one way you could go. Uh, uh, but I think you I, I at least I'm very sympathetic to this point of view that um, it, it's not clear what this page curve would teach us if you were to see it. Uh, but but maybe maybe I'm wrong. You know may, maybe physically artificial is. I, you're, I mean, this is my, uh, it is indeed, there's no natural physical distinction, but maybe if you think harder about it, uh, there is some reason that this is physically natural. Uh, so it could be that there's some, uh, there's some reason of this kind, uh, although I don't know it. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I kind of agree with your perspective that we don't have to see a page curve. Uh, but if you did want to, then this is one way you might be able to see it. Okay, thank you. I also have a general question. So. Would you say that, in, given all the analysis of the second part of this lecture, that basically if you have a setup of the classical setup of a black hole operation, like the one where Hawking did his calculation, then in that case, it's hopeless all to find to expect a, a a page curve in the sense you you have to 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 um, apply the principle of holography of information and so you always have the information outside or if you maybe look at a region which doesn't extend all the way to infinity you can have some kind of weird uh, evolution of the entropy but anyway you shouldn't expect the entropy to grow and then decay just like information was actually escaping out of the black hole using a uh, via some yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's hopeless to see a page curve because of you know because of uh, what what we what the discussion we just had. So if you wanted to see a page curve, uh, you could see it. You I think it's it's possible you would be able to see a page curve by making the right by putting the right mathematical restrictions on it. Uh, I guess the more interesting question is about point two: Is there a, a natural physical sense in which the page curve emerges? Uh, you know, is that I mean you could just you could always if you want to see a page curve once you have all information in hand you can always discard it at the right rate to see see a page curve and I should say one more thing about this uh, you know this algebra of the news uh, uh, one way another way to think about it actually uh, is to think about the algebra that goes from the top of null infinity to u zero so not the algebra that goes from from the bottom but the the top uh, and that's another way to think about it. And the interpretation of this is a little different. The interpretation of this is uh, to think of a set of observers who are like outside and they have all information and then they kind of start moving in, in, in. Uh, and uh, eventually, you know, when they reach uh, future infinity, they've just moved, uh, moved in uh, to zero. And then you could ask if this set of observers sees a page curve. And for this set of observers, you know, for this process where you just have some system and you start from outside and you move in gradually, uh, it is this algebra, it's this algebra from the the top of null infinity uh, to u0 that's relevant and that algebra one can show i did not show it but one can show is isomorphic uh, to this algebra of news operators uh, or at least its entropy is the same as the entropy of these news operator algebras uh, so there are other questions one could ask like this question i just asked uh, or like a question where you just look at the set of news operators uh, for which you might see a page curve so i don't think it's hopeless uh, but i do at least i do feel that there's a natural sense in which the right answer is that the information is always outside uh, so you know, if you if you have some observers who are living here or who are living far away, uh, then for them the natural question is to look at the red part because they're just living in some region, and there is a natural sense in which the information is outside. Uh, but I I don't want to impose my biases uh, on the lecture, and so it is indeed my my feeling, uh, my bias would be that that I think the information is always outside. Uh, but there is a sense in which you might see the page curve, and it may even be that the page curve is natural in some sense. I don't know if that answers the question. Yes, and so put in another way, is is the idea that you, I would say, it is quite clear that you couldn't get a page curve just because information that fell into the black hole, and was um, and the radiation that was the earlier radiation was entangled with the interior, and the information is escaping from the interior. And you're receiving the late radiation that purifies the old radiation. That kind of feature. Of the page curve is probably wrong. Is that right? Uh, I think so. I think that that is correct, and that that kind of a picture would emerge by thinking of in, of information from a quantum field theory kind of perspective, or from a classical. I mean, that is our classical intuition. Uh, 
uh, where you know we we think of uh, a radiation emerging and 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 indeed you know that is the intuition that page had if you look at page's paper where you took a system and you divided it into two parts and so if one neglects the fact that one cannot factorize the hilbert space uh, and that is the intuition that one would have uh, and so it's a natural intuition to have uh, but there is a subtlety in gravity and the subtlety as we discussed is is important for black holes because uh, when you compute the entropy of black holes, you do have to keep track of e to the minus s effects. And so, you know, you have to keep track of these gravitational effects just for that reason. And so you can't ignore this factorization that the Hilbert's, you can't ignore the subtlety that the Hilbert space doesn't factorize. And so uh, for a black hole, I think this, this naive argument that, you know, information should come out and the early radiation should be entangled with the late radiation uh, uh, is, not, is not valid in any natural sense. Uh, but that being said, just to say again, because I don't want to impose my biases on the, on, on, yeah. If you'd asked me this question in the talk, I would probably have said yes. Uh, but uh, so I, 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 to be more neutral, it's uh, not everyone agrees with this. And it's possible that there's some natural sense in which one would see a page curve. Uh, I mean, uh, there's some sense in which maybe what I'm saying right now is not correct. And, and there's some sense in which, you know, it's true that if you keep track of all degrees of freedom, uh, the information is always outside. Uh, but there is some sense in which some degrees of freedom are harder to keep track of than other degrees of freedom. So if you look at point two again, it may be the case, or at least the, the, the other point of view is that it may be the case that there's an intermediate level of coarse craning, which is a natural level, uh, for which this conventional picture where you know early radiation is entangled with late radiation is somehow correct. Um, it's not clear to me that such a picture exists. Uh, and indeed, it's clear that if you just look at the full fine grain entropy, that's a constant. Uh, but whether there is an intermediate level of course training or not, I think is a question of, it, it depends a little bit on who you ask. Uh, my bias is indeed that there is not an intermediate level of course training. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a question about this last slide. I, I think I missed something, but, but um, in the beginning when we uh, introduced the page curve, we uh, we're talking about uh, two quantum systems and then um, then the degrees of freedom um, when we calculate the entanglement entropy um, uh, we we saw the turning point at, at page time when uh, when yeah when, when one of the systems was maximally entangled or, or even uh, contained more degrees of freedom how, how is that uh, how does that, that play here uh, so, so as I said, it, it doesn't in any obvious way, but you know, if you were to take the conventional picture, if you forget about the lack of factorization, then you would have thought that uh, here's a Cauchy slice and you have some, I mean, the, the conventional picture of black hole evaporation is, look, you have some radiation that is emerging. And so you have information that is being transferred according to where I drew the arrows, somehow from one part of the Cauchy slice to another part of the Cauchy slice. If you think of null infinity, then you somehow think that there's some energy that is being transmitted here. Uh, so there's some Hilbert space and somehow in it, you know, there's more information which is emerging at, at late times. And so in that sense, you might have expected to see a page curve. Uh, so it is a, you know, it is a fact that let's say you take a quantum field theory and you take, uh, or this, this table is described probably by good quantum field theory, and you have some degrees of freedom that move from one side to the other side, uh, then you would expect to see a page curve provided you subtracted off the vacuum entanglement and so on. And so if you were to think of the black hole from a quantum field theory or from a local quantum information perspective, then the naive expectation would be that you would see a page curve because you have radiation that's that's coming out. And if this radiation behaves, you know, like a coal or something, then you expect to see a page curve. Uh, but in some sense, even the island formula tells you that, you know, uh, you have to be careful about locality, right? The fact that there is an island at late times tells you that, you know, the radiation region knows about the interior. So there is some sense in which this naive picture of degrees of freedom being localized or information being localized is not correct. And even the island formula is forcing you to confront the fact that you know, degrees of freedom are not localized. Uh, but the island formula looks at a setup where even though degrees of freedom in the bulk are not localized because the entropy of computing is non-gravitational, you do see a page curve. Uh, but uh, here you're right that it's not clear that you would see a page curve. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question or if I said something which was orthogonal to it. If I didn't answer, could you please uh, clarify your question? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having a bit of trouble with, with phrasing my, my, my question clearly. But um, yeah, my, my question was what I think, my, my question was, was in this, this last proposal, what, uh, what are the Hilbert spaces we are looking at? And, and, well, and in the last proposal, oh, your question is yeah. about why if you see only the news, 
is, yes. is this a question? Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. great, great. So this I can answer more precisely. You see, uh, yeah, so we're not looking at Hilbert spaces, but we're looking at algebra. So we can define entropy also with respect to algebras. You know, uh, a better way to define entropy actually in some sense is with respect to algebras. So if you have a region and there is an algebra and there is a commutant, so if A tilde is the commutant, is if A tilde commutes with A, by this I mean that all elements of the algebra of A tilde commute with A, uh, then there is a sense in which you can define an entropy corresponding to the algebra A and an entropy corresponding to the algebra A tilde. The definition of the entropy is as follows. You look for an element, uh, so look for rho that belongs to an algebra, that belongs to A with the property The trace of rho A is equal to expectation value of A for all A belonging to the algebra A. Uh, if you find such an element of the algebra, then trace of rho log rho is S. Okay. And you can show that, you know, if you have an algebra where A times A, A its commutant is the whole algebra, then the entropy of A is the same as the entropy of A tilde. And if you could take the algebra of the full theory, and if you could divide it up into a, a, some algebra and its commutant, uh, then that is the same as dividing up the Hilbert space into one part and the other part. I mean, rather than talking about division of Hilbert spaces, it's more convenient to talk about division of algebras. And so what I was saying here was that if you think of the algebra of only the news operators, uh, so that's what I said here, if you think of the algebra of only the news, then this algebra does have the property that you can define an algebra with respect to the red region of the news and an algebra with respect to the white region of the news and the news operators here commute with the news operators in the white region. Uh, that was this commutator that I emphasized, which I went through a little bit fast. It's the fact that the commutator between the news and the news is local. It's in fact the derivative of a delta function. And so the news operators at, at uh, u negative commute with news operators at u positive. And so the algebra factorizes. So the algebra factorizing is like the Hilbert space factorizing. And so you might expect to see a page curve if you define the entropy with respect to this algebra, as I explained at the last slide. Uh, does that clarify? Yes, very much. Yes. No. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, any other uh, yeah. Go on, yeah. Yeah, of one more question. Um, and this was maybe related to, to, to a question I asked previously, but um, there are lots of setups when, uh, when uh, I think the, what you, uh, like this, this naive picture where we have the, the radiation region in a gravitating bar, um, and then the uh, radiation region is, is, is kept as a fixed region. And uh, I, I think we, we discussed today that, that that this fixing of the radiation region and that, that we are not allowed to do it, this, but yeah. um, is there some intuition uh, to which these calculations correspond or, or is it just, just wrong or? Uh, so, okay. So I, I think the intuition is the, is the intuition that we shouldn't have to worry about the constraints is that, you know, when gravity is weak, uh, you should not have to worry about it. And so you should be able to switch off gravity. So that's the intuition. Uh, so the intuition is that, you know, we have this subtlety, which has to do with the fact that there are some constrained degrees of freedom. Uh, you know, here we are saying something much more precise, but in general, if you just take a Cauchy slice, uh, the intuition is that you believe that things should factorize. And so if you go far away from the black hole, you should somehow be able to ignore uh, the effects of dynamical gravity. Um, and so, that is the intuition. Uh, I think there's a problem with the intuition because in fact, the island rule itself is telling us there's a problem with the intuition. You know, it's telling us that uh, you're going far away, but there's a sense in which, you know, the degrees of freedom in the black hole interior are now redundant with the degrees of freedom far away. Uh, so you see that the effects of gravity, whatever they are, are themselves telling you that, you know, locality is not precise. So you should not think of information being localized in a conventional sense. Um, but uh, the intuition is somehow that, you know, if you go far away, you should somehow not have to worry about those effects. Uh, and that is why uh, one fixes the radiation region. Um, or another, you know, another more precise justification sometimes is that we believe there should be a, a coarse grain definition of the entropy for which it should be good to fix the radiation region. Um, I'm not the best person to ask about this. And, I'm, I'm, I, and once again, I'm, I, I don't want to impose my biases, but I, I, I feel that 
that's not very justified and it's perhaps not correct to just fix the radiation region. Uh, but uh, if, if one were to ask the people, I mean, if one were to ask uh, people who think that's the right thing to do, I think this is the right the answer they would, they would give, which is that, you know, you believe that if you go far away, you should not be able, you should not have to worry about these, these effects. Uh, in some sense, the calculation that I described where you had gravity in the bath uh, kind of shows that maybe that's not the right thing to do. Uh, but, um, you know, someone could still say that maybe that's true for the fine grain entropy, but for some intermediate level of coarse graining, maybe you should be able to fix the radiation region. Now, it's hard to address that in a precise way because no one has defined what this intermediate coarse grain entropy should be. Um, and uh, so, so that is why uh, I'm saying there's some question of who you ask, because the question of whether such an intermediate coarse grain entropy exists for which you can use this local naive intuition or not, um, is a, I mean, it's not a question we know the answer to. It may be that it does exist, or it may be that it does not exist. Uh, does that answer the question or? Yes, yes, very much. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering whether uh, taking into account this um, this principle of holography and and and, um, and I think your bias is that, that this, this, this intermediate level of course graining uh, is not what we should look at, but, but um, in this, this well, taking this bias, whether the, the calculations uh, in which, yeah, in which we do have a gravitating region and a fixed radiation region corresponds to something, but, but yeah. Yeah, maybe they correspond to something, but I think it's, I think there's certainly something which I think is true, which is that uh, there, there, is, there are, there are uh, aspects of the literature where the subtlety is, is, not, even, uh, is not even acknowledged. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we just take black holes uh, in, uh, of all kinds and we, we apply the rule uh, without recognizing the subtlety. And, and that, I agree, is a problem. Now, whether there is a way in which you can actually still make sense of the calculations, that I don't know. Maybe there is. Uh, but there is at least a subtlety. In a, and I mean, there is a significant subtlety, which is that it may be that these calculations are just not... Uh, giving you anything which is physically meaningful. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot.